All right, so happy new year, everyone, and good evening. Welcome tonight to tonight's forum on how to run for office. This is a follow-up to last spring's forum on how the town works. This forum will be recorded and will be available on Belmont Media. Many thanks to Select Board Chair Adam Dash and Town Clerk Ellen Cushman for volunteering their time tonight. In a democracy, governments are run by people who step up, and I thank you both for stepping up tonight with the goal of increasing participation in our town. To all of you here tonight, Belmont is not run by them, it is run by you. I encourage you all to listen carefully, pull papers, and run for office yourself so that Belmont's government does truly represent you. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the organizations co-sponsoring us tonight, the Belmont Democratic Town Committee, the Belmont Pan-Asian Coalition, Black and Brown in Belmont, Community Organized for Solidarity, the LGBTQ Plus Alliance, UU The Vote Belmont, and Belmont Against Racism, with special thanks to Catherine Bonfiglio of BAR for creating the flyer. Thanks so much to all of you for your support and for getting the word out. And now I would like to hand it over to Ellen, our town clerk, to give a little overview of town government and how to run for office. Okay, so um, we were, Adam and I were kindly asked by Julie to join you today to talk about how to run for um, elected office in Belmont so that you can represent whatever community you uh, affiliate with. And we're happy enough to say that Belmont is a pretty diverse community and we need to be more embracing of a lot of different, not just viewpoints, but people. And so this is a great opportunity and I thank you very much for that. Uh, I do see that some of the people who are on the call tonight or on Zoom tonight are um, already members of town meeting. I'm grateful for their participation as well. Um, so I'll try to be as as clear as I can, but I'm um, understanding that there might be a secondary audience of people who would be watching the recording as we get uh, into the lead up for town elections. So um, my name is Ellen O'Brien Cushman. I'm the town clerk. I'm also the chief election officer of the town. That means I run all the elections for Belmont, whether they be local elections, state elections, or presidential elections. And uh, 2020 was a very big year here in Belmont. Uh, however, in all of our elections, we basically follow all the same uh, practices. So what I'm about to tell you applies to all uh, elected offices everywhere, but the numbers and the dates and things like that will qualify only for uh, Belmont. So <clears throat> I think it's really important. So we, we talk a little bit about the basic form of government for Belmont, because for a lot of people who move to Belmont, it's not something with which they're very familiar. So uh, we don't have a mayor. Uh, we don't have a city council. Uh, we do have is um, our two kind of uh, branches of government, an executive branch and a legislative branch. And for Belmont, the executive branch, which is the policy making operational side of the town, uh, there are currently, or starting this April, there will be eight elected boards with uh, very specific topics of their responsibility. That group of eight, however, there is one kind of super board, which is called the select board, and they have a lot of broader responsibilities. We also have two elected uh, full time officials on that uh, side. One of them is the town clerk, the job that I currently hold, and uh, the treasurer. Um, in addition, we have lots and lots of employees, and I think it's at 66, more than 66 elect, uh, appointed committees on various topics of interest. On the other side, the legislative branch, which equates to Congress. In Belmont, we have a, a representative town meeting form of government. It is different than perhaps what other uh, small towns have, which is open town meeting. In an open town meeting, anybody who's a registered voter of the town can stand up at town meeting and express their view, and they get a direct vote uh, on whether budgets are, they wanna spend a certain amount of money or form a certain committee or whatever. In Belmont, because we are a rep of town meeting, that is not an entitlement. We have a certain number of elected town meeting members. There are 288, 36 from each of our eight voting precincts. There's a number of at-large folks. And town meeting is something that, although people affiliate with it all the time, and you'll hear them stand up at meetings and they'll say, oh, I'm a town meeting member of precinct three or two or whatever, uh, they are always, a, you know, during their term, a precinct whatever, town meeting member. However, town meeting itself only meets about six or eight times a year. And when they meet in collective, that's when they're allowed to take action. 
So let's look at the executive side uh, first fairly quickly. Um, uh, obviously, we all understand that we are um, a municipality and our first kind of generation here is to always be responsible to our voters and our residents. Um, Belmont, about 27,000 people who are all of our residents. And of those people we have, it ranges, but about right now, 17,000 people are registered voters. The other people are children, um, people who are not yet qualified to vote, or are people who are not U.S. citizens and therefore they're not qualified to vote either, or people who choose not to register to vote, which is also um, available, obviously. Uh, here are the eight elected boards, um, again, in the executive branch. Uh, the Housing Authority, uh, consisting of five members. Um, the Cemetery Commission, consisting of three assessors, three Select board three, I part of bolded them because we'll talk about them in a moment. A uh, brand new board that was just created and it will appear on the ballot for the first time in April is the Municipal Light Board. Uh, that will consist of five members. Um, a school committee um, consists of six, Board of Health three, and Library Trustees is six. Uh, <clears throat> you see these sort of um, weak uh, red lines. These departments, these uh, groups, uh, elected officials also have um, operational or department uh, responsibility and they have entire groups of employees who work directly for them. And then we have a select board here, which uh, manages um, the preponderance of kind of the town's effort um, with all of these various departments down here through the town administrator, um, as well as police chief, fire chief, and the town account. So this is how I kind of think of, uh, of the town structure. Um, we do have little stars over here just because uh, these are elected boards, but they do not have operational responsibility. Those are contained elsewhere down here in these, uh, the assessor's office or in the DPW. On the right-hand side, you can see that we also have um, the treasurer tax collector and finally the town clerk. Most, all, almost all of these uh, boards have a term of service of uh, three years, uh, with the exception of the Housing Authority, which is a five-year term. And uh, this year, because the Municipal Light Board is unusual, it's the first time it's going to be on the ballot in April, it will have to start from zero. So there are three offices that will appear on that, um, on that ballot. They'll be electing two people for three-year term, two people for a two-year term, and one person for a one-year term. Okay. Well, let's move over to the legislative side. Um, for again, voters and residents, the legislative side of our town, town meeting uh, consists of 36 elected town meeting members for each of our eight precincts. Uh, 2020 federal census, the decennial census, uh, the data came back in late October to reveal that Belmont in these eight precincts was not all that balanced anymore. So a few of them, the boundaries had to be adjusted so that our population of residents might be uh, more appropriately balanced. So that means that this is an unusual year and it's actually a great year because if you're thinking of running for town meeting, there are lots of opportunities, especially in precincts one, two, six, and eight. Uh, for those uh, precincts this year in April, we will be electing 36 town meeting members for each of those precincts. So anyone who is a current town meeting member has to run again. Um, there is nobody who holds a, a seat ever. Um, anybody who has been is, is up for re-election. Those seats are all considered open and blank. And so this year in each of those precincts will be 36. In the other precincts, which is three, four, five, and seven, we will be electing uh, only 12 members because those borders of those precincts uh, in the re-precincting effort has not uh, changed because of the census results. So those were already in balance, in other words, and one, two, six, and eight were not exactly in balance. In addition, sort of capturing this whole sort of circus going on on the, the uh, legislative branch in the town meeting, we have an elected moderator um, and that person runs for a one-year term. Uh, there was a move a few years ago to try and expand the uh, term of the moderator to a larger number term, but that was defeated pretty soundly at town meeting, and so it remains as a one-year term. Occasionally, we do have 
um, partial terms that might pop up um, in some of the precincts when, for example, a town meeting member <coughs> moves out of the precinct, moves out of town, has to resign for personal reasons or job reasons, or whatever. This year, uh, so far, we have two partial um, terms. I think they're both two years here in precinct three, and that's the only place across the town. Uh, so that might be an opportunity for someone who's thinking about dipping their toe in and isn't really sure they want to do the full three year commitment. Uh, between now and the time that uh, sort of the final uh, ballot is set, um, which ultimately turns out to be um, February 15th, um, other town meeting members might choose to say that they're not going to be interested in running again, or they're not interested in contain continuing on their seat, and so those partial terms will uh, might be changing. Every week, once the ballot begins to get developed and it's starting to come together now, as people are um, telling us whether they're existing town meeting members who are interested in running again for seeking re-election uh, or new people come in and fill out their nomination papers, as the ballot starts to get more developed, um, on a pretty much weekly basis, I send out a draft of the ballot so everybody can see who's who's already filed, who's running um, and on the ballot at any time, and, uh, and also to preview the ballot for uh, proofreading purposes. Uh, in addition, it's just a very important so people understand that the authority of town meeting is pretty restricted. It is not a place to suddenly think that you are going to be the finance manager of the town. Um, your expectations need to be sort of in line with what town meeting may do. And I have a little bubble down here that tells us generally what town meeting can do. Uh, the authority is pretty restricted to making general by, uh, bylaws, which are only specific to Belmont, zoning bylaws, again, that's about property only for Belmont, determining budgets and spending, initiatives that might come up that, for example, particularly the um, select board might like, um, for example, outlawing or limiting uh, single use plastic bags was a, a recent one, um, you know, dealing with resolutions so that the town, you know, uh, uh, expresses its generalized opinion, accepting certain state laws or creating committees, such as a building committee, which <coughs> would act on behalf of town meeting to spend money that town meeting says it's okay to spend. Uh, here's I basically say what town meeting does not do. It does not manage uh, the direct responsibility the executive branch does. Um, they cannot reach into the executive branch and tell the select board what to do, for example. A really smart executive branch member will be attentive um, to the influences and, and observations and, uh, and actions and, uh, and comments that are made at town meeting. They are very, very important, and they should guide what we're up to in terms of the executive branch. Now, if you're wondering whether you are eligible to run for elected office, there are only, uh, the only real requirement here is that you must be a registered voter of the town of Belmont. There's plenty of time still to become a registered voter. You can be a registered voter on the very same day that you decide to take out nomination papers. So um, the requirements in Massachusetts to be a registered voter, you have to be a citizen of the US, you have to be at least 18 years of age, and you actually have to live in Belmont. So you cannot be on a border or, you know, have a summer house in Hull and register there and decide that you're going to be representing a community in Belmont. Okay, here's my here is my little chart of how you can run for town meeting. And these, for me, these are kind of clear <laughs> points. It shouldn't really be overwhelming. It's actually sort of three separate lines, but I chose to put them all on because I, I think they're really important to kind of consider um, all together. So first, I would say the orange lines. These are things that I think you should consider before you make a commitment to run for town meeting or for townwide office. <laughs> you need to consider your current time constraints and commitments, what your family <laughs> obligations are, your work obligations, your travel obligations. You need to consider your skill sets. Um, for example, uh, I ran for the cemetery commission because I had certain kind of skill sets. I was a geologist in a prior life and I had some business experience and I had some personal information personal reasons why I want I was interested in running. Can you commit the full term? This is something that a lot of people don't consider. If your term of office is going to be three years, it's really important that you kind of look at your own personal horizon and say, am I to at least get to that 
the end of that. If you cannot, there are many ways to serve and it may not necessarily be in your best interest or the best interest of the town for you to run and then drop out after uh, occupying a seat for only one year out of three or five. Uh, the town has a lot of information on our website. Um, of all the annual reports are there. The committees all have individual web pages and going on and researching what these committees are, are working on, what their initiatives are, look at their minutes, uh, how frequently they meet, uh, all of that should influence you. And then lastly, of course, why should you run? I mean, you shouldn't just be running because you think it might be you know, interesting to do. That might be one part, but that's not necessarily going to keep you going for three years. And if your committee is meeting on a weekly basis, pure interest may not get you there. So you do have to sort of do this evaluation that says, okay, now I've made up my mind, I'm going to run. So the blue line, this is where we're going to focus uh, for the next couple minutes about nomination papers. You come to the town clerk's office, nomination papers, which are just sheets of paper, you sign a line that says, yes, I am a voter of Belmont. We check to make sure you are, in fact, a registered voter of Belmont. Um, we give you the instructions on how to do it, what to do, who you can ask, et cetera. And then you ask Belmont voters to sign those papers. Um, and if you are running for town meeting, you are restricted, the people who sign your nomination papers, you are restricted to the people who live within your precinct. So we will give you a map, uh, the new map, and you can ask strangers, you can ask people you know. Sometimes right now, especially in COVID, uh, it has been a bit of a challenge for some folks during cold weather to think of how to get nomination papers um, signed. And I do have a couple of hints uh, later on. Um, there is a very firm deadline. It is February 15th at five o'clock. You must turn in your nomination papers to the, to the town clerk's office. By that time, they have to be stamped. And then the town clerk's office staff, I'm going through every single one of those signatures and, and doing what's called certifying them using the central voter registry that we have access to for the state. Once all of that happens and you have met the minimum numbers, and we'll go through that, um, your name's on the ballot. It's great, very exciting, a little scary that your name is now on the ballot. So then you have a couple other activities and obligations that are gonna happen, uh, like researching the campaign finance laws and trying to figure out whether you should be forming a campaign committee. Are you gonna self-fund your campaign or are you gonna take donations from people? That's a pretty important decision that needs to be made very early. Then you get into how you're gonna broadcast your message. Adam's gonna talk a lot about campaigning, how to meet voters, and then finally this wonderful, those three stars for um, election day. Here are those deadlines I was just talking about, and I'll talk about the minimum number of signatures that are required. So the deadline again, February 15th, 5 p.m., absolute hard deadline. If you are pounding on the window and it is 5.02 or 5.01, you are too late. And you would have to run an, a, a Pain, which is something we can help you figure out. But let's try not to do that this time. Let's try to do it with purpose. Uh, the minimum number of signatures that are required if you're running for a townwide office is at least 50. Um, however, we always recommend that you gather at least 60 because um, you know, people might not be uh, registered voters. You might think that they are, they're not. They may not be a citizen. It's irrelevant when they're signing your papers. They don't really want to say, well, I'm not really a citizen of the U.S. or I don't know whether I'm eligible to vote. I don't know what the requirements are. So sure, I support you. I'll sign that. And you are going to have a little bit of fall off. So just um, don't put yourself in a position where you're going to come that slim. And likewise, for town meeting, again, um, the minimum is 25. And for town meeting, you must only get them from people in your precinct, whereas townwide, anybody, any voter in Belmont. So Adam is going to talk a little bit about this or about this whole little section, but I do have one or two more quick things to talk about. Um, the difference between the nomination paper submission time period, which is February and April 5th, which is the election, is exactly seven weeks. Now that seems like it's a really long time until you have run a campaign. And you realize that you need to make commitments to people. If you're going to do campaign literature, you're going to get out there and talk to people and try to convince them of your point of view. And the League of Women Voters will be running a, uh, they issue a voter guide with the opinions or a little statement from every uh, candidate. And that deadline is a lot earlier than a lot of people um, believe. And so some of them are, will get caught and not necessarily have their kind of position or their thoughts together. You should be thinking about that 
right from the moment today, if you're thinking of it, um, until you get going, because it's going to move very, very quickly. And it is draining, but it's really fun. Um, the local election process is really fun. So here's some tips. Mask up, obviously, right now, especially <laughs> sanitize, keep your distance. Here are some ideas that have been successful uh, oh, just over the past two years. Remember, we've run, I think we've run seven, uh, six or seven elections during COVID. <laughs> So we're getting pretty practiced at it here in the town clerk's office and town wide. Um, a lot of people have been very successful by putting a, um, a little table for town meeting, particularly put a table on their front walk with some pens. You can even use an election campaign uh, pen, you know, elect Ellen or whatever. Um, put it out there with your nomination papers, post it, um, put a, a sign up. Some people have actually put a big sign up just for neighbors saying, hey, I need your signature. Please sign here. I'll be happy to represent you. Um, and here's how to contact me print out little business cards so that they know how to get in touch with you as well as you know how to get them. Uh, the nomination papers, here's the, the, obviously the secret is, try to find family members who are uh, living together or co-locating. Um, co and so you can get four or five at once instead of worrying about just that one perfect person. Um, because the goal here is to get the minimum number of signatures to get on the ballot. It's not to get only just your friends, neighbors, and grand supporters. It's to get on the ballot. That's the first goal. Um, don't lose sight of that. That's really important. Uh, carry your nomination papers with you everywhere. No matter where you go in town, carry them. You never know when, who you're going to meet at CVS or uh, even at town. Uh, here we do have a caution. The, when you're delivering materials, should you decide during your campaigning, and I'm sure Adam will cover this, some residents, we did get a call in 2020, a couple calls and people were nervous about people putting things through their mail slots. And so um, on the town clerk's website, there is a whole thing about how to run for office, some hints about what to remember. The U.S. Post Office pretty much owns that um, mail slot that goes into your house, according to their opinion. Uh, so if you're going to be putting anything, delivering it, put it inside somebody's, you know, door handle or under their, their mat or whatever. Hosting Zoom get togethers around a campaign, uh, a particular topic or a neighborhood issue um, has been very, very uh, effective. And then always you can download the voting list when we've established a voting list for the election, um, which will happen 20 days before the election. You can vote, um, pull that up at any time. They're already posted now and they'll be posted a couple more times from the town uh, clerk's uh, public records portal. It's accessible right from the main uh, web page. And you can sort that as many ways to Sunday so that you can minimize your cost, maximize the number of people who um, get to hear your, see your message. So around town, some people will say, why do you bother to vote in local elections? It really doesn't matter. Um, and I actually really am an advocate for voting locally, even if you miss the presidential election. I think voting in local elections is more important. And I know I might be in the minority, but here are the things that local government does to affect and impact everyone's everyday life. So yes, we allocate by town meeting and through the executive and the legislative branch, we allocate and approve spending for things that matter to us. So let's think about some of those things and I've listed them, but they're roads and schools and trees and libraries and services for seniors and children and playgrounds, conservation land, trash, all of that. Uh, a lot of the funding that happens or all the funding that happens and therefore some base decisions about how those things happen, that's discussed at town meeting and those opinions are expressed. Yes, they are in, in larger quantities, not necessarily in how much we spend for every recycle bin, but um, a lot of the kind of responsibility and the kind of give and take on those programs happens town meeting. Um, what can be built in town? Something that passes a lot of people by. Um, if you know, you're in a, a town or a city and you're driving through and you see that some, some places allow 15, 20 story buildings or they allow loud lighthouses or they allow warehouses. And those are decisions that those towns or cities have made in order to allow those kinds of things to impact certain neighborhoods or certain um, streets, but they do have impact on our neighbors. And so Belmont has, uh, we have our own little look and town meeting gets to decide on all those zoning bylaws. If you have a very particular interest, this is something to pay attention to. And lastly, one of the other things, where categories of business may operate and their hours of operation. These are just kind of three things. Belmont has a, you know, sort of a sundown um, style. We don't have people, all these businesses open overnight. And that's a, a very purposeful choice by Belmont.
So Belmont voters, when it matters to them, and we know this to be true because we have actually ranged from the, in the 90s, we had low 12% and we've had a high turnout of 85, 87%. And so a lot of the 85% ones are in presidential years, that's true, or when there are ballot questions on that really matter to people. And so the tip that I would give you is make your campaign matter to them. It's really not about you, it's about that group of people who you've chosen to represent. And so I did put out here a couple little resources from the town clerk's office um, just on the website. Um, and particularly we've added one new thing, which is a contact list of all of Belmont's um, elected officials because we had a question from somebody who was trying to reach them and uh, couldn't get their phone number or couldn't get an email. And so we've put it all in one uh, handy little list. And uh, all of the election deadlines, precinct maps, who votes where, voting locations, laws, uh, campaign finance resources, all that kind of stuff is on the town clerk section of the website. And lastly, if you don't see it or you don't know or you don't know how to ask the question, feel free to send it to us at town clerk, all one word at belmont-ma.gov. Hope that wasn't too long. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was great. That was a great overview. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I wonder, do you want to take some questions or should we go right to Adam? Whatever Adam would like. Um, I'm easy. Whatever you want to do, Julie. Okay. So if it, does anybody have any questions right now? I have one, Ellen. First, thank you for this. And I agree uh, wholeheartedly about local elections. Thank one you, of Catherine. the questions that I sometimes get asked is how much time is involved? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if anyone has ever crafted a you know, if you're going to be a town meeting member, you know, this year it took 20 hours and another year it took 30 and just get to give an approximation of how much time I mean, I can say, you know, it takes a lifetime to be on the select board in hours, yeah. you know, just to give sort of a ballpark sure. figure to people. I just wondered that, if that's that was That's a great possible. question, Catherine. Um, so uh, I think that Marianne Scally, who's been a town meeting member for a very long time, I was at a, a League of Women Voters uh, how to run for town meeting um, presentation and uh, she was on the panel and I thought she was brilliant. She said, you know, there are, there are town meeting members really come in a lot of different flavors. And so there are town meeting members who want to dive into every detail of every budget line and read all of the documentation that comes out and attend every single meeting and they all of the prep meetings as well. And so uh, for those people, it can be an avocation. I mean, they really can put in like a miniature job and they can put in, you know, 10, 12 hours a week, just leading right up to town meeting. And they are attending the school committee meetings or attending the, the select board meetings. They're watching the light board. It, it's easy to get sucked right into all of the details of a uh, local government. Uh, and then then they attend town meeting and town meeting when we do meet for the six to eight um, nights per year, uh, we start at seven o'clock and we do try 11. Um, however, we all know that that doesn't always abide and depends on the will of town meeting. And uh, so it could go, we have been at sessions that have gone till one or two in the morning when things have been really contentious and very um, time sensitive. And that was mostly in the nineties, but typically we try to use that guideline. So about four, so about four hours, um, four or four and a half hours um, times six or eight. And I, I was the days that we have it are Monday and Wednesday. They start uh, this year. I think they start on Mar on May second is the first day, which is the Monday, uh, Monday Wednesday, and they go for a couple of weeks. Then they take a break, and then we begin the week of uh, Memorial Day. We start that Wednesday again, and then we conclude. So we divide our town meeting up into two sections. The first one being the uh, general bylaws, zoning bylaws, initiatives, accepting um, state laws, and then all of the financial discussions, financial budgeting, CPA, etc. Are half. So that's the kind of the, the first person who wants to do everything. And then there's the second kind of group person who reads all of the materials that we send them and we send everything out by email uh, and provide links to all kinds of reports and sometimes there are videos, etc. Um, and those people, they might spend, I don't know, two hours to three hours kind of uh, attending the League of Women Voters night. They'll read the materials three, four hours, and then they'll go to town meeting. And then there's the last group that said, you know, 
I'm just going to read, basically give a read over of the warrant, which is the agenda for the meeting. And then I will decide um, uh, what I need to, how I need to vote based on what I hear at town meeting. I'm going to be completely receptive to what I hear at town meeting. And I want people to influence me and win my vote. And so there's a, a full palette of those. Guess what? All of those are perfectly acceptable um, and pretty successful. There's a lot of drama at town meeting, so it can be. So I guess I would just to, to, to clarify, I think that's great, but maybe just to say this is generally, you know, when, when you meet, if you're running for school committee, it's generally this many meetings. Mm -hmm. If you're running for, you know, uh, whatever, you know, trustees or whatever, but this is how many <laughs> times it meets a month. And yeah. yes, there'll be preps just to give a ballpark for people. Yeah, and I, I think, Catherine, that I would go back to the comment I made earlier, which is it's the responsibility of the person who's thinking of running to do a bit of research. And one of the ways that they can do that is to visit the website of the town uh, of that public body. And the, that will list all of the agendas and the minutes. And so you will be able to do research pretty quickly. Um, and also, of course, just Google them and figure out what uh, if there's any hot buttons or issues that the community is interested in that uh, that haven't or have been addressed by that body. So see if you want to put your toe in. Fair enough. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ellen. So um, just a quick thing before we go to Adam, I just want to ask Ellen if uh, there's a place where people can find your slides or where um... sure. they'll be on my website tomorrow. Great. So running for, yeah, um, we actually have a section on the town clerk's website called running for uh, running for elected office. And uh, we have a bunch of resources in there already. So I'll just uh, add this in tomorrow. Great. Sure. Okay. Thank Thanks you for very asking. much. And Adam. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Adam Dash, chair of the select board. Uh, that was great, Ellen. Thank you so much for, for doing that. Um, yeah, there are two things, running for town meeting and running for townwide office are two very different things, although the general process is pretty much the same as Ellen described, getting on the ballot, campaigning, and then sort of election day and the immediate lead up there too, are sort of three distinct phases. Uh, as you know, for town meeting, um, not the, the re-precincting re piece that, that Ellen described notwithstanding, typically you basically have to come in 12th. So when you think about it, and you keep it in that in mind, it's really not that bad. Uh, so if you can keep in mind, you don't have to win in first, you just have to come in 12th. And sometimes there are only 12 people or fewer even running in some precincts from time to time. Um, sometimes it's not as daunting as one would think. However, it's just extremely important for the reasons Ellen stated, town meeting is crucially an important position to hold. Um, and it's a great way to familiarize yourself with the various workings of town if you uh, then wanted to run for a townwide office or serve on one of the larger committees. So um, I would say in those phases, as far as getting on the ballot, and Ellen pretty much said it, I don't need to repeat that. Campaigning for town meeting um, back in the old times, I, I would go door to door. I mean, I think getting the signatures is a great way to meet people and get the word out, standing in, in, in this current COVID will not be forever. So I would say that standing in Belmont Center and stopping people in the street, going to my kids' soccer games and asking for signatures in the on the sideline, having something in your hand to actually show them and talk about, I found was a good icebreaker. And you can go door to door in the neighborhood. Um, and uh, not a lot of town meeting members I know do that, but I think it's a helpful way to go and, um, and get the signatures in. You know, I try to get way, way, way more than I need because I like the fact that that's an excuse to go around. Ellen knows that it's a good way to get. It's an excuse to go around and talk to people because um, you know you're gonna you, you walk around for one afternoon. You'll probably get enough to get on the ballot. It's not a. It's it's about that, but it's also about more than that. It's a good way to talk to people. Um, I find that, and then I find printing up flyers um, and just explaining who you are, or maybe a little resume and what the couple of issues that you like, so you can hand them to people if you're doing the the signatures. Leave them with something. If uh, you're not comfortable talking to people or opening doors or, or anything like that because of the current scenario, um, I would leave. You could leave a flyer at a house or mail flyers to folks. Um, I would say uh, don't put it in people's mailboxes or open it because that would be wrong. Uh, but there's certainly uh, under mats. Uh, I've been creative. Some people's houses are challenging, but uh, you know ways to sort of slide it between the 
screen door in the jam or under the mat or under a planter or something so it doesn't blow away. There's always ways to do it, but yeah, I def definitely avoid the mail slots and opening mailboxes. I, that is not okay. Um, so doing that, and again, it's an excuse to talk to people and hand them something and give them something. It's just a simple, I did it. I did my first ran for town meeting. I think I did it on my computer and printed a hundred of them with some paper on a printer and black and white and handed them out. Um, I, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. You don't need a logo, you clip art or something. It's not, not that big a deal. And then on election day, I found it was important to, uh, I found standing at the polls, um, at least in the morning and evening rush was helpful. There were a couple of people afterwards who came out and said, well, you know, I voted for you because you're the only one I've ever met who's on the ballot because you're standing here. Um, I, you know, you can have a sign or you can just have a name tag and you can wave and say, hi, I'm so-and-so and I'm running for town meeting. I'd appreciate your vote. You'd be surprised how effective that is. Um, and, you know, so for town meeting, you don't need a campaign committee. You don't need to raise money. Um, you just print some flyers and talk to people. It's really pretty much it and come at 12th and you're all good to go. Um, Townwide office is a, is a different animal, though it basically operates the same way, just on a larger scale. Um, obviously, for running for select board is the one I'm more familiar with, but um, I'd say that fundraising is probably going to be an important part of it, especially if there's a contested race, because unless you have a lot of money to, to throw around, you're probably going to need some help. It's also a good way to get people invested in your campaign and to sort of drum up interest by asking people for money. Um, and you know, you can't really do, I find town me, a town wide campaign, you really can't do it alone. You really need some help. Um, if you have, if you do raise money, then Ellen has some excellent resources on the website about how to open a campaign committee and you need a chair and a treasurer to do that. Uh, and so, you know, then if forms have to be filed um, before and after the election at the end of every year. They're not that daunting, to be honest with you. If you just basically keep records of what you spent your money on and what money you took in and you just fill it out in a form, it's really not that bad. Um, but, you know, and so you get some, you need some, but you need money if you want to do signs, if you want to do mailings, if you want to do robocalls, if you want to have, um, you know, uh, standouts, you know, in places uh, with, where people stand with signs at major intersections for you, things like that. And you do have to spend some money on it. It's just the way that it goes. Um, again, going door to door, I found to be very helpful. Um, I say I walked a ton when I was running for select board in a contested race in 2017. I clocked, I think, 14 miles some days. You would be amazed. I got in really good shape how hilly Belmont is and how many stairs people have. Up the stairs, knock the door, down the stairs, next house. Up the stairs, down the stairs, next house. Up the stairs, down the stairs, all day, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, some nights during the week. Um, because you know, honestly, there's almost no substitute for it. I talked to, and it's really important, I think, if you're running for anything to maybe talk to people who've run for that office before or who are currently in that office about it. Um, but I, I was told when I was first running, there was no substitute for the candidate going door to door. I'm not saying you have to hit every door in town. I think you can be strategic there. Are, you know, neighborhoods that might be more favorable than others. And some people, if you've got the voter list, you'll know are not registered to vote. You can just skip the house or maybe they haven't voted in a town election in the last you know, 10 years, you can skip the house. But um, you know, it really is, I think, important to hit all the areas of town, which I did. You know, I think you, to, you need, because every area in town and every neighborhood has its own concerns and people talk to you. I was walking down the street and someone pulled the car over, got out and go, you're that guy running for select board, right? I wanna talk to you about this, 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 and this. And it's like, it's great um, to get that kind of interaction. So I think it's, it's important to really do the door-to-door. -door. There's really no way around that. Um, but again, kids sporting events, school events, things like Martin Luther King breakfast and uh, you know various uh, places where people are outdoors these days. Um, I think you could definitely go and uh, get signatures when that time comes around and then campaign. Um, holding fundraisers to raise money is a good way to do it. Um, I don't know about in-person fundraisers these days, but uh, you certainly could put out a uh, you know an email blast or get uh, you know put something out on social media and have it shared. That's a good way to do things now under normal circumstances. You know you you know you invite people over to your house and put out some you know chips and soda and uh, you know give a little speech and ask for some money. Um, you can do that uh, you know, if you're fancier or bigger campaign. You know rent out a restaurant or whatever the case may be. But it doesn't have to be that big a fancy thing. Um, 
Uh, but buying signs and printing cards does add up. I would say if you're running for townwide office to go to any event you possibly can and speak intelligently at it. Um, if there's a hot button issue coming up at the select board or school committee or whatever, or town meeting and you're a town meeting member, you know, speak to it. I think people will remember that you said something intelligent and added to the conversation. And I think they'll have a good, a good feeling for you. Um, I think it's very important to watch the meetings of the bodies you're running for. Um, you can certainly go in the media center and watch old meetings and then watch the meetings during the campaign. It's important to be up to date on the issues because people will ask you about them. Um, you go in, again, the uh, call people who are influencers, who you believe would be helpful or possibly uh, donors uh, and sort of get their advice. Uh, and, and see if they would put some word out. Some people who are influential or names are well known in town, if they you know, tell people to vote for you, it carries a lot of weight. Um, I know it's hard to promote yourself and it's hard to ask for money. It, it, it is. It's very hard to say, I'm great, vote for me. I'm the, I'm the better of these people running. And by the way, give me cash. It's, a, it's not something we're ingrained naturally for the most part to do. Um, I gotta say it was hard to sort of get in the rhythm of that. But once you get going, it's hard at first, but once you get going, it does get easier. Um, it is helpful if you have your staff, if you have helpers or volunteers who can do bookkeeping and organizing and sort of telling you where to go and sort of looking at the voter rolls and go, go to the street and look at these houses and don't go to those houses and give you a little list. And a map was very helpful because the candidate can't, shouldn't be doing that. The candidate needs to be out talking to people, um, making calls or whatever the case may be, not you know, spending all of their time, you know, putting together the campaign finance report. Not that you can't, but it, it's probably not the best use of the candidate's time because there's some things only the candidate can do. Um, obviously, participating in the uh, various public debates, the, the Belmont Media Center usually has a debate. The League of Women Voters Night, there's usually a debate. Um, and, at the, and actually having people to help you prep for those, field you, you know, questions about current events or, or oddball questions, just to see how you, so you can get a feel for it. Time yourself. They usually give you so many minutes for an opening and a closing. You know, I would write the opening out and I would set a timer and I'd read it. And then I'd make it longer or make it shorter and I'd read it again and I'd read it again until I had it almost basically memorized and, um, and have, the, uh, have it down so I would end exactly right in the time. Same thing with the answers to questions. You need, if you only get a 30 second rebuttal on some very complicated question, you need to really boil that answer down and have it ready to go. You pretty much, I think, would know 90% of any question that would be asked just by looking at what the issues of the day are. There's always going to be a few questions that are completely out of left field, but for the most part, you know, you, you, you're not going to get a ton of, I would think, surprise questions. You just need to sort of make sure that the office you're running for and the fields that it covers that you're sort of well versed in what the issues of that moment are. Um, in the election run-up, it's important to have people help you and you also to get people to show up and vote. Um, that is a, obviously the very important part. Having everyone love you and donate money doesn't mean anything, but they don't show up. So that get out the vote effort, particularly at the end, um, takes a lot of legwork. I mean, we, we had people go when I first ran door to door all around the town. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes it can just be phone calls making sure that your people who you've identified who are supporters and you know said they would vote for you actually do. Um, and again, go to the polls on election day, have people hold signs, because obviously when you're running town-wide, it's not like town meeting where there's one polling place you can just go to and park yourself. Um, there are multiple polling places. So you need other people to be at the other polling places, particularly in the morning and evening rush when most people vote. Uh, there, there's never a guarantee you're going to win, but you need to put in the work. So I think so you'll have no regrets at the end that you didn't leave it all out there. I mean, that was sort of what I thought is like, I could win or I could lose, but it's not gonna be from lack of trying. I, I was gonna put it all out there and whatever happened, happened. It is weird walking around town and there's signs with your name on it around. It is very weird. Uh, people stopping you in the street and star market and restaurants and badgering you about things both nicely and not so nicely. It's, gets a, it, was, it takes a little getting used to. And I would also keep in mind, I mean, I'm not, not a downer, but you know, you're going to get attacked by some people online and it's okay. You only need 50% plus one to win. Not everybody's gonna vote for you if in a contested race, it's not gonna be unanimous. I think I got 60 something percent at the beginning when I first ran in 2017, which meant 40% of the people in town didn't want me to hold the office. And that's just 
Oh, that's gonna, you have to be okay with that, that not everyone's gonna like you. And it, it's all right. Um, I wouldn't worry about it. It's a, it's a very concentrated process in Belmont, which is some level, which is really nice. If you pull papers in January or even in early February, you're done the first week in April. I mean, basically your entire month of March is, is a frenzy. And, and honestly, if you're running townwide, I would hope you wouldn't wait till February 15th to pull papers, get signatures and turn them in. That's a little daunting. It's better to, to pull them in January, probably thinking about it even in December, maybe, but pulling papers in January, getting your signatures, getting them turned in in February while you're doing all these other things and sending and getting flyers out there and um, fundraising. And then also in March is a complete sprint. And then in April is just a couple of days, it's a blur and then it's over. So at some level, it's a lot of work, but it's a very short period of time. COVID is hard. I did run in 2020. Uh, I got Thankfully, I ended up with nobody running against me because that would have been a bit of an odd situation because when I pulled the papers and turned them in in February, we didn't have COVID. And then I was on the ballot and then COVID hit and the whole everything changed. And of course, we printed you know, flyers and signs. And I, since I didn't have anyone running against me, I didn't want to go door to door in the early days of a pandemic. I just didn't do anything with them. Um, but it's, uh, it's a little easier, I would think now, but you can still do signs, you can still leave flyers, you can still um, you know, make calls. Although I understand door to door is a little tougher, but you don't necessarily have to stand in their face at the door. I would imagine you could ring the doorbell and step back and sort of wave and talk to them from a distance with the mask on. Um, you could have a call party, have a bunch of people call, get numbers and have people, you know, do that, write postcards like in the old days, um, do it the old fashioned way, get an email chain going, do standouts with the signs. Social media is great way to leverage it, get posts or record videos and have um, people share those links. There are a lot of ways we can get the word out. Um, the higher the, as I said, the higher the office you run for, I think the more help you're going to need and the more money you're going to have to raise and the more time you're going to have to spend. As I said, I spent pretty much, I think every weekend day going door to door and attending meetings and events all the other times, it did become a bit of a job. Um, it's kind of good training for actually serving on the select board, which sort of has similar hours, but um, I, you know, again, worst case scenario, get some good walking in in the winter. And um, you get to meet a lot of interesting people. I, I was amazed the number of people I met and spoke to. I would never have gotten a chance to really face-to-face -face meet. It was, you really get a real feel for Belmont when you walk it, you know, street by street. Um, I think it's easier if you're an extrovert like me. Um, I mean, I like campaigning. I thought it was a lot of fun. But um, if not, it's okay. I mean, you can get helpers who are, or you can go door to door or go to these things with someone else. You don't have to go by yourself. It's a little easier to sort of, you know, to walk up to a stranger and say, will you vote for me? Or will you sign my card here? And half the time they guess they walk away from you without saying a word or, or tell you to go away, but it's helpful. The other half of the time, they're very nice and they're very um, helpful or they really want us, they want to hear what's your elevator pitch, what's your 30 second or 60 second explanation of why you're running. And uh, I like talking about stuff like that. So having someone with you can say, oh no, let's do one more. Let's do one more street. Let's do two more streets. Uh, just to keep you going, I think is helpful. Um, democracy require, requires people to put themselves out there and to suffer the uh, slings and arrows of Twitter uh, and to have doors slammed in your face. That's part of the process. Right. Look, even if you don't win, if you run honorably, and you speak intelligently and you spur productive debate, you can't really lose. Thanks. Thanks so much, Adam. I have to say that I remember that you came to our house uh, when you were campaigning. And I don't so think there were too said, many I didn't go to, to be honest with you. But. Yeah, but I, I do remember that. And my family remembers you as the guy who came to our house. So it was very effective. <laughs> Well, I thank all the people who let me in to use the bathroom or gave me a drink of water back in the days when such things were possible because it, um, it got cold <laughs> someday, walking around in January someday. Julie, do you mind if I just make two more quick comments? One is, or to build on what Adam said, one, um, a lot of people when they start running, they think, oh, you know, where could I possibly go to have my signs printed or how much does it cost to 
something like this or that kind of stuff, robocalls or whatever. All of the campaign finance reports that uh, are required of townwide office are online on the town clerk section of the website. So you can go not only to look and see how much people have spent on their campaign or how much they've raised or donors names, which are required by the law, you also can see the sources, um, uh, you know, a printing company that you think they got a great deal or, you know, um, or a hospitality company that provided a food truck or something like that. I mean, they, you can get a lot of information just by going on to just in the little town clerk's website and, uh, and see that. And then secondly, the other thing that Adam was talking about the walking and, you know, not necessarily knocking on people's doors. I was thinking I actually have, uh, have been very admiring of people who've been carrying their campaign, their nomination papers with them or their campaign materials with them when they're out walking their in COVID, we have so many people who are out walking, whether they're walking their dogs or they're just walking in companions um, with companions. And that is a great way to just sort of go up to people and either walk with them because they're already your neighbor um, and you may not have ever seen them before. And so people uh, don't mind if you kind of approach and you can easily stay, you know, eight feet away from them and, uh, and maybe have a conversation uh, on the sidewalk or on the street. So those are excellent ideas. Excellent ideas. Look. Comment, Ellen, could you follow up on, on campaign finance to let folks know some of the, the regulations about um, who can fundraise and where you can fundraise? Because sometimes that's an early sure. pitfall for people um, and also about if you're a public employee. And so those are oftentimes right. uh, slip ups that um, yep. novice people have. Great. Good questions. Uh, so uh, the state has a uh, an office called the Office of Campaign and Political Finance, OCPF, and they are bulldogs. Um, they govern everything that has to do with payments um, and expenses and uh, and receipts um, having to do with elections and people who are elected. So both in the campaign phase and those people who are elected. Uh, so to your point, Jean, anyone who is a public official, a public employee, uh, it doesn't matter if you are a driver on the T, um, a toll collector out in Western Massachusetts, or you are you know, uh, the town clerk in Belmont. If you are an employee of the town or municipal or state government, um, and there are actually federal laws to this effect as well, but if you are an employee of a municipality or a, a district, a, um, a like a district attorney or county uh, employee, a district school systems, etc. You may not campaign treasurer for any um, campaign. Doesn't matter who. You may not ask for money. So therefore, you cannot be the person who's sitting at the fundraising table selling tickets um, to allow someone to come into a fundraiser and saying, "Hey, can you write a check for fifty dollars to whoever the candidate is?" You also so you cannot be the treasurer of that campaign, the bookkeeper, as Adam was um, describing. If you are a um, an employee, you also uh, you don't have a choice. You must form a campaign committee, even if you spend zero dollars. Um, because you're required to fill out slightly different forms. Um, you have to provide any dollars that you get in, any dollars you get out, uh, even if you're self-funding a campaign and you're spending any money at all. Um, so the campaign finance people, the OCPF, we have all those links online and uh, they are terrific. They have a lot of determination. Of uh, FAQs, um, they have brochures and little pamphlets for uh, municipal elections, and that's where you would be um, required to be sitting. Your, the laws are different for municipal elections as they are for uh, the state house in terms of filing, who files, and limits, etc. So, um, yeah, that's one of the appraise appraise yourself uh, very early. Thank you for asking. And the deadlines are are eight days before an election, 30 days after election. And then if you are elected um, and you served in an elected capacity, you have to file every year by January 20th. Great. Any other questions? I'll toss out one more because it is it does come up every time, sometimes every year. Is um, although you weren't encouraging writing campaigns, yeah, Ellen. Um, sometimes after the ballot because does come together, there are only you know mm -hmm. eleven people running for twelve seats. Yeah, so there is a sticker campaign where people, someone could decide, or someone might approach you to run, a, you know, mm -hmm. a sticker campaign. So could could you briefly explain that? Sure. Sure. Uh, so actually, there are kind of two ways, but the, the sticker or the write-in campaign, um, traditionally known, there's information again on running a write-in campaign on my website. Um, so 
let's say that uh, February 15th comes around and uh, and you decide at eight o'clock at night, oh my gosh, I completely didn't realize I've left those papers there. I never turned them in. Oh no, I really wanted to run. What do I do? Um, there are ways to still run a very effective campaign. Um, it just means that your name is not going to be on the ballot. And so you have to work harder to make sure that people you know are going to vote have a way to get your name on the ballot can print up little stickers as long as they conform to the right size uh, and they contain the name of the person ideally the name and the address of the person who's running and they can be stuck directly onto the ballot um, and tell people how to uh, how to run a sticker campaign or you can just give people your name and say you know vote gene mooney and uh and if they write gene mooney and the voters intention is clear the election workers will give gene mooney um a credit. It's always a great idea for anyone who's thinking of running any kind of a write-in or sticker campaign to advise the town clerk's office because we will make sure that our election workers have your name on their tally sheets and they're they're going to be looking for them. So if they spell your name incorrectly and they put a you know M O N E Y instead of M O O N E Y, um, then they can decide whether they can make the leap and say yes, that appears. It's a it's a vote, a clear vote for Gene. Um, that's one way. And the other way, if, you know, we didn't have enough people to run, for example, uh, oh, and, and doing a write-in, sometimes it can be three votes that might get you in. Sometimes it requires a lot more. Typically, when there's a seat that's open, you know, it's somewhere in the 40s. Uh, seems to get the person in um, if uh, if there's an empty seat. And so that means that people who have run campaigns to have friends, family, residents, I mean, uh, um, neighbors fill in those uh, stickers or, you know, write the names. They've actually run campaigns versus someone who decides on the way to the polls that they want to tell somebody and, you know, say family members, please give me three votes. So it's more often than not doing a, a little mini campaign, even in the last couple of days, will maybe put you over the end. And then if at the end we have, um, have uh, let's say there's a tie for an office, for example, in town meeting, if the there is a write-in spot that's open and 12 people voted for, you know, Susie and 12 voted for Kim, then uh, there is another opportunity in terms of a, a caucus of uh, the town meeting members who already are elected because it's a failure to elect. We don't make decisions between uh, a tie uh, off for office. It's not allowed by uh, uh, by law or by Belmont's bylaws. So um, we would run a caucus of existing elected town meeting members, and then anybody can run for that and be selected to uh to run and uh, serve as a town meeting member to fulfill that term. Okay. It's a unique opportunity, I think, to, to run for office and it is a privilege. It's a good example, I think, to the kids, you know, to, to run a good campaign for you know, kids to see your name on a ballot and see you <laughs> out there, you know, doing that. I think it's a really good, a really good example and it's it's a very unusual existence for a few months i i will definitely say that but not, it's it's a great experience i'm i'm glad i did it uh serving is a whole different ball of wax i guess we could have another night what it is to be an elected official because i uh, ellen could describe that as well um but uh first you gotta win i have a, a question that came up from chat that uh, if you don't mind julie it sure. says, I think it's Brian Saper who's asking to me to remind people that if you're collecting money, you should not be collecting cash for your campaign. You should only be collecting checks so that uh, you can report out. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Well, thank you both so much. That was really um, a great overview and insider view of uh, how to run, um, you know, from from town meeting to select board so really appreciate that and hopefully uh, we can get this uh, together on Belmont Media so that uh, people who missed it tonight will be able to to access it and uh, and then Ellen thank you for putting it on your, your sure. uh, website as well I think that'll be that'll be a great resource for everybody um, and so in the in the interest of time unless anybody has a, a last minute question I just want to thank you both so much for sure coming on and uh, volunteering your time tonight. Um, and thanks for all of you who came and attended and uh, are either currently serving or are considering um, you know, running for office. Uh, uh, it's a great opportunity for, uh, for us all. So 
Happy New Year to everybody. And thank Julie, you can I do a public service announcement? Just one sure. more, yeah. because I do see there are some members of town meeting who are currently serving. Um, don't forget that if you are in uh, a position where you have to seek election this year and you want to be considered a candidate for re-election, you have to turn in your letter of intent by uh, January 25th um, at five o'clock. And otherwise you will be collecting nomination papers and signatures just as we've gone through and described. Thank you. Thanks for that reminder. I actually sort of happened upon that by chance to see that. And I thought, uh oh, I better do that. <laughs> Set that in. So, um, all right. Well, thank you and good night, thank to you everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. Excellent. Good night. Good night.